Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast in association with Charles Tirrett. Believe it or not, it's the 8th of December already. If you want to get dressed up for all those Christmas parties, Charles Tirrett more than have you covered. If you're really keen to make an impression, you should check out their dinner suits or if, like us here at Wisden, our Christmas party is a bit more low-key, Charles Tirrett have also got you covered with patterned shirts, polos and maybe even a cheeky jacket to sharpen up the outfit. Check out the collection online at charlesterrett.com and don't forget to use our special code WISDOM22 to get 20% off. We'll leave a link in the description and a reminder of the code there as well. Anyway, on with the show. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today is Ben Gardner and Katia Whitney. We'll be talking a little bit more about the Pakistan-England series, focusing on what went wrong for Pakistan before taking a look at all the other cricket that's gone on in the last seven or so days. We'll talk about England's low-key ODI series in the Caribbean, Marnus Labuschagne's latest home masterclass, assessing whether or not Bangladesh are genuine World Cup contenders. We'll be picking an all-time England basketball 11 and we'll do a bit on the controversy around David Warner's leadership ban, as well as some county news. Um, let's kick off with Pakistan then. Ben, we didn't spend that much time on them when we did our show reviewing the first test match, but there were a lot of curious selections. Um, and with the focus on England, those selections have gone under the radar a little bit. They were arguably quite a long way off the best side they could have picked. Four debutants. Zahid Mahmood's not even a regular for a state side. The one regular, the one debutant he did well was Sal Sh- Sh- Shaquille, who's got an excellent first class re- record and looked good in the middle order. But then you've got Mohammed Abbas and Hassan Ali, who the latter of whom is likely to get a recall for the second test. They've, those guys have got two really good overall test match records and they're out of the picture with a bunch of uncapped guys favoured instead. And that feels a bit harsh and quite often we're critical of England being overly loyal to players. But Abbas and Ali haven't really done that much wrong and that Pakistan attack looked really weak in the first test. Yeah, uh, it's it's funny because actually because I wrote a piece on the site about what Pakistan did wrong and there were a couple of comments being like, isn't this harsh? They were quite close to saving the game. But I think on a on a pitch that flat, they had to be really quite bad to lose it, basically. As good as good as England were, and you shouldn't take anything away from them, excuse that game run so well. I think that and, and I mean, even looking at that that first innings score, right, just looking at what they did wrong in the game, they were four hundred odd for three. And then for, at that point you should be thinking like the game should be absolutely safe here. And so even from then, five seventy odd, that's a bit of a that that is undershooting what they should be getting from there, I guess. Look, looking at those bowlers, so yeah, there's they're both slightly curious cases, I guess. Uh, Hassan Ali, obviously he was amazing last year, uh, averaged what, 16 with the ball, I think. Um, but this year he didn't go well in the games he played, but he also just didn't play very much. So it's hard to know what's, what's exactly going on there. So he played four tests, five wickets, 67, playing in five white ball games, obviously wasn't a part of that T20 World Cup campaign. He wasn't very good in the Kaidi Azam trophy either. He took 14 wickets at, at 40. So in a way I'm surprised it's him they've returned to rather than Mohamed Abbas, who's still only 32. He's not that old. Um, and he's only played three test matches in Pakistan. So if the idea is that he's not good in those conditions, that's a bit unfair to come to that conclusion after so little cricket. Yeah, and, and he had a decent campaign in the Qadi Azam. He didn't play that much, but he got 18 wickets at 24. That's good. He was obviously really good in the County Championship again. 50 wickets at 18 for Hampshire in, in Division 1. Uh, he did... Obviously, his overall record looks really good. That's obviously... Um, it's a bit pushed up by how good his start was. And he did fall off a little bit, but still. So he averaged, what, 40 in 2019 and then just above 30 in 2020 and 2021, which is, is not, you know... It's, it's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, and you'd think you, you just need some seniority in that attack. I think the attack for the first test combined had fewer test wickets than Joe Root. No, that's true, yeah. Which is, uh, which is not a great place to be. And, and yeah, and then the other guys, uh, yeah, this uh, a- a- Abra Ahmed, who is by distance the leading wicket taker in the... In the QEA, uh, 43 to 22. Mm. Next best was was 31. So he was by distance the leader there. Um, Mahmood was 30 wickets of 46 in the same competition. Uh, and they're on the same team and Mahmood didn't get in it. Yeah. Often. And and I know we, we talked a bit about Abrahamad and we were saying like, we're not sure if he looked like, it's not like he was ripping it lows, but I also think that actually that kind of uh, sort of stump to stump, lots of googlies that actually could possibly have quite a lot of success against the way mm. England, are, England are batting. So... Yeah, it's it, it, the, the the team selection is odd. I think, to be honest, the thing I'd be more concerned about, though, is the overall mentality that kind of seems to surround the, the Pakistan team. Like, if you look at the, the players they've got, they, they're not 
very far at all from being a, a properly serious test side on paper, right? Like Babra Azam and Mohamed Rizwan, we know they're both brilliant. Abdullah Shafiq looks really, really, really good. Shaheen, I know he's injured, but he's obviously brilliant. There's lots like about, about Nazim Shah. You, you, when you look at the core of that team, there's, there's maybe only a few players away from having a, you know, seven players they can really sort of count on. And that is kind of what you need to be a good test team. You but wonder where Shadab Khan is in all this. I mean, he's one of the best white ball arounders in the world. Uh, Done okay in his brief yeah, test yeah, career, but like hasn't played for a couple of years. With the, with the ball, 30 with the bat, but just hasn't played very much test cricket either, yeah. Um, I'm surprised they haven't had a look at Mohamed Herrera, who's really young. He's uh, he's 20 years old, but uh, I've watched him on a couple of, of streams this year, uh, which is the, the, the coverage of that tournament, by the way, is, is amazing. And he looks really, really good. He's been the leading run scorer in the last two Kaidi Azam trophies. Uh, and he's 20 years old. He's 20 years old. Pakistan yeah. under 19 did really well for them. D- double hundred in the final of that competition uh, this year. He's got a triple hundred to his name. He's uh, he's Sherb Malik's nephew. <laughs> if that makes a difference or anything. Uh, but so so to get back to the mentality point though, that they, they they should have the ingredients to be a really good team. And yet it feels like when teams like Australia and England show up, they're kind of just happy to sort of compete for enough of a game before kind of falling away. I mean, Rami's Raja said as much when um when Australia turned up and they rolled out those really, really flat wickets, he put out the statement basically saying that they couldn't beat Australia on anything or they, they couldn't compete with Australia on anything other than them really flat wickets. And you're kind of like, what? why are you saying this? Mm. Australia, Australia at that point hadn't won a series away from home since 2016, I think. that's a, That should be a team where you can kind of prey on those, on that kind of, that psychological blockade they had mm. over winning away from home. This, this is an England team, sure, they'd won six out of seven coming into this series but before that they'd won one out of 17 and this was a, a first test away from home and they gave them in a way the perfect conditions for that strategy to work and that only England could have won that game playing the way they did in a in a way uh and so if they kind of just I feel like they just need to back themselves it's so odd considering they they seem like they have such belief in themselves in mm. in t20 cricket how they can be so different in test cricket it's odd uh, mm. and I guess that you know the, the good thing about Pakistan cricket is you're never that far from an one minute, swing. one minute down, one minute up. Exactly. Yeah. What's it? What's it? Is it, what's it K- Kudrat Kanazim or something? Nizam? Is that the thing? The uh, uh, it's what um, uh, one, the, one of the coaches said during the England series. It basically said like uh, it's you know it's dependent on nature. Like it's out, it's out of our control essentially. Which yeah. at the time he was sort of ridicule, ridiculed for, and then became kind of a motto of their T20 World Cup yeah, campaign. I mean, it really wouldn't surprise me if it won one in in six days' time. Yes. <laughs> um, Katia, Ben talked about Mohamed Herrera, this batter who scored millions of runs in domestic cricket. Who a lot of people are like, why isn't he in the team? I guess for someone to come into the team, someone needs to come out. And one of the curious selections has been Azar Ali. Obviously, he's been part of the Pakistan team for years, but it's not his role in the team. Not that straightforward now. Well, he's had a really odd year. He got dropped for one test match. So, so I guess at the end, it comes back to what Ben was saying about mindset. So he got a really big hundred at surprise, surprise, Raul Pindi um, against Australia. And then in, I think it was Lahore, he scored another a, a big innings, not a hundred, but a big innings. And then after poor results against Sri Lanka in the first test, he got dropped for the second test, which I think Pakistan then lost anyway. Um and then he's back. But if you look at his numbers, he averages over 40 this year still. Big credit to the first innings, which I think was 185. And then in the last three years, he's also averaged over 40, which isn't that bad. It's quite good, really. Mm. Um, and if you look at that top four and you've got Shafiq, you've got Imam and you've got Azar, some scored over 7,000 runs and you've got Baba, that looks actually like a really, really good top four. Um, and if... Maybe if you take away that constant question over his selection, maybe then that's something that Pakistan batters thrive under. So, so basically they should be playing basketball as well <laughs> um, and giving people confidence. But it's just a bit of a weird one. I don't like, he's not the reason why they're losing. Mm. It, they get themselves in really good positions, like Ben was saying, and then they just lose. Yeah. It's nothing to do with Azar at three. It's nothing to do with having a lack of talent. It's just some kind of block or barrier or something. Yeah, I guess it, I guess his selection shows the the modelled thinking in the same yeah. way that Hassan Ali's gone from one of the best bowlers last year to out of the side, out of the squad, and then might be straight back in. As a rally, they obviously thought something wasn't quite working for, for them to drop him two tests ago, and he's yeah. straight back in. Um, well, he did have that really lean period after after they came to England where he lost the captaincy mm. quite harshly, in, in my opinion. Um, and then Barber had the captaincy, and he went, I think, 18 innings without scoring 100. But over the last 
couple of years, he's not really been that bad. He's mm. not been bad enough to say he's the root of all their problems, yeah. basically. It's interesting you say that they should be more more like England and play basketball. Ben mentioned Shadab Khan. I, I do think when you're seeing Zahid Mahmood struggle that much on debut, Shadab Khan, also his batting brings so much to that side as well. He'd make them so balanced. And part of the reason why I kind of thought England were going to win on that last day was like, look at that tail on the seam shot at eight. Just having someone who can bat at eight would make quite, quite a big difference. Um, Shervo asks, would the pod like to apologise to Will Jacks, please? Uh, the lad got a six foot on debut. The last time that happened for England was in 2003. The last time it happened away from home for England was, was 1976. Yep, I do do stats now. Um, ben, we, we talked about Jacks. We weren't, I don't think we were that critical. I think we, we said that we praised him for his economy rate, being able to bowl 40 overs, especially for a guy who didn't bowl in first class cricket a year ago. Um, do you, do you want to explain why we weren't potentially as effusive in our praise as we otherwise would be for a guy on debut taking six wickets? Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, it would be quite a boring show if all our analysis was just purely based on... The number of wickets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, this guy played the best innings because he got the most runs and this guy's the second best and that sort of thing. Uh, no, look, w- w- Will Jacks... I, I really, really like Will Jacks as a player and he makes loads of sense in this England side. Uh, for this series and then even then he's out overperformed expectations I think I said in a previous show that if even he there's a scenario where he could average loads with the ball and not very much with the bat and still have really done a job in this side and if, if England did win the series you could say that he was he had a good series even in that case and he's obviously out overperformed that I don't think England would have expected him to take uh, six wickets H- however I mean if you look at what the six wickets were this isn't a guy he didn't run through Pakistan, mm. anyway, he deserves credit, obviously, for for keeping on bowling when you know he was uh, when everyone was going for lots of runs and there was no breakthroughs coming through, and 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 he he bowled tightly enough, um, and uh, he got the rewards in the end. Um, and I think the, the the thing is, it's my point was more just because Phil said, "Can he fill that Moen Ali role?" And it was my more was more just people not underestimating what Moen Ali was to England team for quite a long time in mm. terms of like being able to to take wickets when conditions weren't helpful and batters are really good players with spin. That's something that very few players in history have had. Jax can, not, we don't know yet, he might improve to be able to get that ability possibly. And Gareth Batty did compare him to Moen Ali even at the start of the summer. And there have been just the odd hints at time at the Oval that he's been able to get that, like that real action on the ball. Um, but even if he's not that like not not being able to be as good at Mo and Ali as taking wickets that's mm. something that's true of, of absolutely loads <laughs> of players uh and uh you know Will, Will Jack showed a bit with the bat uh that he can he can score that he can score runs but I think I think basically I think if Jack is to have a long test career at the moment unless England sort of redefine the role of what a spinner is in test cricket which is possible it would be as a number six who is bowling uh, a bit here and there but that I think he is easily capable of doing that but based on that debut i'm not seeing a spinner who is uh sort of going to to rip mm. through sides i guess yeah. which i still think is very even though he took six i think yeah and also I, I would say though that it's not as if england have loads of spinners who can rip through sides mm-hmm. and i think the way so i i i can't I agree with everything that ben said what i would say though is if he over three test matches does comparably to leach which he did in the first test match it's possible that england look at it at the end of the series go like well they didn't do that differently with the ball. This guy is a top six batter. Why not have him at eight as well? So I think that's a potential way in. And I think that's probably what England are looking for, given that they selected three spinners who batted eight, who bat eight in the squad in the first place, which is, a, as you said before, a very niche role to, to um, give yourself that much cover for. Um, well, it's quite a good job, isn't it? Because he came into the series as the fourth choice spinner. Yeah. Because you know, Joe Root was second choice spinner. <laughs> yeah, he's done quite well already. Um, before we move on, some James Anderson stats to warm the soul. Uh, so in the last 11 years, he averages less than 24 in Asia. So only Shami, Ashwin, Jadeja and Harath have more wickets in Asia at a better average than Anderson over 11, an 11 year period. Since turning 35, he's taken 192 wickets at 21. For reference, in his, in his entire career, Pat Cummins has taken 202 wickets at 21.5. Since turning 30, he's taken 404 wickets at 23.36, which would put him in the top 20 test wicket takers of all time. Dale Stain, for reference, took 439 wickets at 22.95. So 
uh, yes, James Anderson, still very good. So he's, he's he's come in since he turned 35 and staying since he turned 30. Yeah. Which is, which is yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, then we got a great email in from Paul who wrote in to say, I imagine that you're all enjoying the current successes the England men's test team are seeing out in Pakistan. It strikes me that a lot of their success is down to the mentality shift introduced at the beginning of the Stokes McCollum era rather than this group of players necessarily being known for playing an aggressive style of cricket anyway, and then being given a captain and a coach that finally unshackled them. After all, this is mainly a group of players who were generally not very good and quite unimaginative for the 17 tests beforehand. It got me thinking, there must be a swathe of former players who would dream to play in this team, who maybe weren't given permission to go out there and play with such freedom like this current crop of players are. So my question is, who do you think would make it into an England all-time Basball 11. The likes of Peterson and Botham surely make it in, but Atherton must be out, right? Food for thought, and thank you so much for all the brilliant hours of podcasting. Cheers, Paul. P.S. A suggestion for myself would be to add in an email to the show message on your social accounts to make it easier to message in. That is a good idea, and we will do that. Um, but back to the question. Um, Katia, do you want to kick us off with some uh, all-time England basketball players. Wow. Um, you've got to go with Flintoff, don't you? Mm-hmm. He's in. Uh, yeah, classic. Um, players who would have thrived given the backing, Ravi Papara, mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, still needs another go. Um, <laughs> who are we thinking spinners? Rashid? As I, I said before we started recording, mm-hmm. 100 test matches. Yep, absolutely. How many wickets? Uh 473 um, bit conservative <laughs> um ben you got a couple yeah i guess because there's, there's two ways to go to this there's the white ball guys who you think um you know J- joss butler as a keeper opener might be quite fun um i think that that i've mentioned before and on the last show uh, but <laughs> Mo- moeen i think as, <laughs> as in that attacking spinning role never having to worry about containing i think he would have really really thrived um and then going back a bit bit further if you're looking for guys who don't necessarily fit that sort of attacking mold but do you feel in the right environment might have been uh more successes you've got what, mark ramprakash and graham hick possibly are two names um ian salisbury as well if we're looking for another leg spinner obviously because mm-hmm. he had, it, the thing with salisbury and i think phil's made the point before people talk about salisbury and they'll say ian salisbury was sort of like uh a, a failure at test level or and they sometimes might even just say a failure overall and then you look at his, his first class record. It's ridiculously what, good. Yeah, uh, it's you know, eight hundred eighty four wickets, an average of thirty three. Like that, you can't call that's that's by no means a, a failure. So uh, he's possibly. I think Goff would have just been fun. Obviously, that sort of likable, uh, uh, gregarious sort of cricketer. And then going way way back, obviously you've got to have a shout out for, for Gilbert Jessup and his uh, mm. his fastest England Test hundred. Um, Percy Fender longer? is one who. Uh, uh, I've, I mean, I've obviously never watched him play. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and it, it is, the description of him in the Almanac are great, but he's just saying like this ball, uh, th- this guy always hit the ball really, really, really hard and attacked whenever the situation uh, and apparently once hit the ball uh, on the front foot over cover out of the oval, which is Struggling which is to believe that. Yeah, I mean, and I guess if other things are struggling to believe, there's also Albert Trott who apparently hit, is the only person ever to hit uh a six over the Lord's Pavilion. And again, mm. there's, there's not video footage of that either. So that's... Uh, Can't uh, imagine why. Yeah. <laughs> um, Who are we giving captaincy to then? I think Jessup. I think Jessup. He, the, the, the fact that he's still so prominent all, all these years later. Surely it's um, got to be both of them. That's the ultimate. Didn't oh, we mentioned both, didn't make, yeah. mention both of them. Oh, Twelfth man. Yeah. Uh, obviously, KP, that was mentioned in the question. Yes. Um, we're going to have Butler opening and taking the gloves. And we've not mentioned Ali Brown in a while on the pod. Yeah. So I reckon he'd, he'd have been okay. I mean, just Gothic was really good, but... True. Uh, uh, yeah, let's go with that. Ali Brown, fine. Uh, just, I think Tresh Gothic probably fits the bill slightly better. Okay. So we've got a team of Tresh Gothic, Butler, KP, Jessup, Captain, Stokes, Botham, Flintoff, Sam Curran. Just got to have Sam Curran in there. Yeah, Percy Fender would bowl as well. Okay, should uh, we get Percy Fender? Yeah, and he's apparently catch flies at slip as well. So, so uh, actually, we've not mentioned Bairstow, who obviously gets mm. in so how about if we make the rule that they can't be currently available for test selection yes so that means we could so but we lose butler then we as lose well, butler. Then, mm. which is a shame but i think we, we do have a lot of batting in that team it's but then do we lose rashid is rashid he's not currently available mm. that's fine rashid so, would be on this tour if he was available so how, how about we have it they're not 
currently uh, fit. For they wouldn't have been picked if they were fit. If that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think people understand okay. the spirit of the eleven. Okay. If Sam Curran's not in it and Josh Butler is, that's why. Cool. So Treskothic, Butler, KP, Jessup, Stokes, Botham, Flintoff, Percy. Fender. I know we still got Stokes though. Oh dear! Right, hang on. Hang on. Who's eleven going in? Yeah. So I imagine this is how McCullum picks his team. Treskothic, Butler, KP, Jessup, Botham, Flintoff, Fender, Moeen, Salisbury, Rashid, and Goff. That's great. <laughs> With uh, Graham Hick, Mark Ramrakash, and Ravi Bapara on the bench. <laughs> None of those test matches are going to five days. No, it's, no. It's funny because the England squad in Pakistan has three players in the uh, in the number eight uh, spinner role, and we have three players in the uh, mm. uh, attractive but couldn't quite crack test cricket yeah. test cricket role. Crucial. So. Mm. Um, from Pakistan to the Caribbean, England are currently two nil up in an ODI series against West Indies in what is potentially their last ODI series before the Ashes next year. Um, Katia, we'll start on the cricket itself before going on to the wider issues surrounding its coverage. Um, what do you think England have learnt from the first two games, if anything? I mean, it's tough to say nothing because they have won two ODIs, mm -hmm. but some of the West Indies batting particularly has been questionable, should we put it that way? I mean, Lauren Bell did an absolutely fantastic job yesterday. I think mm. she took three wickets in eight balls, I think it was. And the West Indies were six down inside the first 10 overs. And she did bowl really well, to give her credit. But there were some god awful shots in there as well. Mm. Hayley Matthews in particular um, is quite guilty of that. She, uh, Bell was hanging it um, outside tossing it up and hanging it wide and they just went for it um so yeah like I guess in terms of learning how to win again because maybe over the summer that's what they mm. kind of got lost in closing out those results and and winning particularly as an ODI side that's that's a positive um but the West Indies are in a really transitional period at the minute although it feels like they're ever in a transitional period and um, they've lost Dottin and Stefani Taylor's no longer captain and she's not selected in this tour but I get I guess the positives come out of it particularly in that Siva in the first game she scored 90 off 96 on her first game back in the side which is really really good to see her back in the runs again and a shout out to Amy Jones yesterday actually she played an absolutely blinding innings her highest score since 2019 I think mm. um, and she came in under a bit of pressure as well she hadn't really been great in the summer and she looked pretty uncomfortable given the captaincy um, and I thought it was a really odd move actually to give her the vice captaincy again to this tour. But then I guess Siva will have that back when she's when she's a little bit more settled mm. in the side. And then the big news is that Alice Capsey is ruled out for the rest of the, the tour with a with broken collarbone mm. and is a doubt for the T20 World Cup, which is absolutely huge. Yeah, yeah, definitely. She's been so, so good ever since, well, beginning of last summer, really, in the 100 mm. and then breaking into the England side this summer. Um but collarbone, how long do collarbones take to heal? Not that long, surely. They're quite a break, uh, I don't know. You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it would be huge because they said she wasn't going to play the under-19 World Cup, which she was um, eligible for. I guess now she can't play it anyway. Um, but given that she opened in the match she did play, I'm not really sure what they were thinking her role was going to be. I think they were looking to experiment and now they've kind of got to go back to their more traditional t20 lineup but she'll be a huge loss because she obviously bowls really well adds balance to the side and mm. she she's quite talismatic and, and she's that big game player that you really want in that mm. t20 world cup she, she's so young with no fear and she she could be that kind of player who just kind of galvanizes everyone around her but yeah without her for sure it's going to be well hopefully not hopefully she'll be fit because you want the most exciting players in the world playing mm. in a t20 world cup but if she's not there then that'll be a bit of a blow mm. I was surprised that Emma Lamb was left out in the first place. Mm. I mean, she she looked to me pretty good during the summer, obviously, uh, like across, well, uh, the, across all families, really, but especially the ODIs and the tests. Mm. What, what, why, why was that? And I guess what she's now back in, and is that does the Beaumont Lamb thing seems like it makes sense at the top? I don't know. Um, don't know why she was left out. I'm, I'm on the same page as you. I think she sometimes gets left out undeservedly. She plays really well. She she played really well yesterday, actually, when she did open, and then she got run out trying to get back on strike for the second, which was pretty mm. stupid, to be honest. Um, but she was playing really, really well, really fluent. Um, and yeah, I think she is unfairly left out. In, in terms of the top of the order, they've got kind of a lot of openers. Mm. So Sophia Dunkley at the top of the order in T20s, which was the Commonwealth Games thing when they did leave Tammy Beaumont out. They've got Lauren Winfield-Hill back in the T20 squad after she scored so many runs over the last summer. 
um, Danny Wyatt as well, I guess they could put down the order, but then that kind of unbalances it with all-rounders, especially if Capsie's not playing. So I guess they've just got too many people who bat at the top of the order. And then with Alice Capsie, it was just, it was a strange decision, but they did say before the series that, John Lewis did want to look at players in, in roles that he hadn't necessarily seen them in before. And this whole series is about John Lewis looking at players and John Lewis finding out what his best 11 is mm. for the T20 World Cup. So I guess they're just experimenting. But yeah, it was a bit odd that Lamb didn't play and that Capsie opened as well. Mm. Um, and Katia, it's, it's just been a very difficult series to follow. Can, can you tell us first about what the level of coverage has been and then what you make of that? Um... I think I think there's there's two issues. So firstly, there's the coverage itself, um, which for those who haven't had the pleasure of playing Guess the Score um, on Sunday and last night has been pretty poor. So the first match for a good chunk of the England innings, there wasn't a score up. And then when they did put the score up, it was wrong, had the wrong batters batting. And so score up where? Just on, on the screen, on yeah. the screen. Um, you know, so that was that. And then they the, this feed kept cutting out because they're the BT, BT using a stream from... Cricket West Indies, which relies on bandwidth um, from the stadium in order to broadcast, um, which is clearly not there. Although I'm struggling to understand why at the Sir Vivian Richards Stadium there isn't bandwidth to broadcast it. But this, mm. the, the feed kept cutting out. Pictures were blurry. Couldn't really see what was going on a lot of the time. The cameras were shaking like it was being recorded on. Like the camera they were recording it on had spent 20 minutes warming up kind of before they broadcast it. So it's been really tough to follow. And credit where credit's due, yesterday was marginally better in that the score was up from the start and it was largely correct. But I don't think we should be praising broadcasters for putting a correct score up mm. on international cricket. And then you've got the issue which has kind of compounded it, which is the tour got uh, announced about a month less than that in advance of when it actually happened. Mm. So there hasn't, it's been kind of botched together at the last minute and... BT haven't got a team out there and they've hidden the stream down on BT Sport 5, which I didn't even know existed. Um, and I, I can see why, because the stream is so bad, you would want to hide that. Mm. Um, there's no radio coverage in the UK. And I, um, TalkSport don't have the rights to it. Um, so I don't know who has the rights for it. Probably no one. Um, so yeah, it's been really difficult. Um, and it's really disappointing to see this level of, or this lack of thought go into coverage of, a women's international series, which, you know, Sophie Eccleston's playing, Hayley Matthews is playing. And, you know, even if the players weren't as high profile as they are, that's not an excuse not to broadcast it properly. But, mm. you know, it, it's the last, both sides last series before the T20 World Cup, there's a lot going on. So mm. it's kind of, you know, let's see it. Let's see what's happening. Um, but yeah, it's been really difficult. And it, a bit disappointing. it kind of feels like a missed opportunity as well. You know, it's weird that this England side is breaking all sorts of records for attendances last mm. summer, but also for next summer as well. Um, and you, you, you just thought, and I know you're right to point that how late the tour was announced is a big part of this. This would have been a really good opportunity to kind of boost uh, the culture of traveling support mm. in the women's game. Like we know that the Caribbean is the most popular destination for men's tours. You'd think this would be a really good opportunity. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's quite a big shame that it's been missed. Yeah, well, well no one's going to travel out there with three weeks notice. You yeah. know, no, no one's going to be able to do that. Um, least of all with flights and expenses and, and organizing a whole tour and that kind of stuff. And it's the same with broadcasting. It's going to be really difficult to organize that late notice. But you're right. When, when cricket's here and when it's breaking records and the ECB are, you know, shouting about that and saying, look how good this is. It's amazing. And that's correct. They're right to shout about that. But to sit back when your players are being misrepresented on, not misrepresented, but not represented to the standard that they could be, when it's not your shiny product, mm. it kind of doesn't sit right. You know, the ECB, Cricket Australia, all these people, they should be leaders in the world in making sure that women's bilateral cricket is going to be broadcast and going to be set up to succeed and mm. marketed correctly. Um, because too many of these bilateral tours, the coverage just isn't good enough anymore. Mm. Yeah, and just on the timing of the tour, um, e even though loads of people ended up going out for it, it was thought that the number of people who went out for the men's tour in the Caribbean was affected by how late it was. And that was still months and months in advance. Mm. So, you know, you're right to say that with a few weeks notice, that was always going to be an impossibility. Um, before we continue, here's a message from the Wisdom Shop. 
prices on our Wisden Ales that I'm, that I'm showing to our YouTube audience right now are in an all-time low for Christmas with up to 45% off on all our packs of pale and amber ales. Each can design features a different Wisden Cricketer of the Year. And genuinely, by chance, I just picked up an Ian Salisbury one. Uh, and for every can, you also get a collectible beer mat, which also has a Wisden Cricket of the Year on them. Uh, you can grab these on sale now at the Wisden Shop, available in packs of 6, 12 or 24. Wisden chalices and tankards are also available on sale as the perfect complement to our ales. You can grab all of these just in time for Christmas at wisden.com forward slash shop. Again, we'll leave that link in the description. Australia are 1-0 up against West Indies after beating them by 164 runs at Perth. Manus Labuschagne and Steve Smith both scored double hundreds in the first innings. Labuschagne then scored another 100 in the second. West Indies offered decent resistance with the bat. Craig Brathwaite scored 100 in the second innings. Tegnarine Shanderpol scored 96 runs across the two innings on debut. Um, they did lack a bit of penetration with the ball, however. Uh, Ben, no surprises that Australia won comfortably on Labuschagne. He's, he's now the number one ranked batter in the world again, overtaking Joe Root. If you're going to believe the ICC uh, rankings and the rating system, uh, his rating points tally of 936 is now the 11th highest of all time, which is higher than de Villiers, Callis and Root um, ever got to. Pretty much the highest point Coley and Richards got to as well. So if they're to believe, if they're to be believed, Labuschagne is properly in the all-time great category all the names around him are that how do you see that and do you think that's that's premature with Labuschagne uh it's premature I mean I'm not saying that he he won't reach that level there's obviously uh he has had an extraordinary start to his test career and now that he's what 31 tests in you're asking or 29 tests in you're asking is it still a start or is it just his test career I mean the main thing is just that um he is still yet to fully established himself in overseas conditions basically which isn't all his fault you know he's played he's done well it's just he's not been anywhere near as good as he's been in australia exactly so he, he averages more than 70 in australia <laughs> and then he averages what around 40 elsewhere i mean and you know he obviously made his name in that england series and he averaged 40, 50 in that series but didn't he didn't make 100 in that series uh he did get 100 in sri lanka that was his first 100 he only did okay in that pakistan series this year when everyone was getting loads of runs um, so that, I think that's, that's just the thing is we don't, basically we don't really know yet if Labuschagne is, uh, is, is in the Steve Smith level of, of all condition genius, or if he is kind of in that slightly lower rank of the batters, the, the Australia have, but was still very good, uh, and, uh, very good at, uh, or um, incredible at home and are able to do good things away. Maybe sort of like that Usman Khawaja kind of rank, or if he is in that level above. Um, and that's something we don't, we don't know yet. And he can score lots and lots of runs uh, this summer and it won't really say one way or the other, but he does have a hmm. huge year next year when they uh, obviously play India uh, in India and then an Ashes and possibly a World Championship final as well. And so I think hmm. at that point, you might have that Labuschagne has, you know, got 200s in each of those series and you're like, right, yeah, this guy's really, really something uh, sort of generational or you're saying this guy's a, a very hmm. good batter. Uh, but not in that league, I suppose. Mm. Just on Steve Smith, since he said, I'm back, baby, whilst batting against England, <laughs> he's hit 80 not out, 94, 21, 200 not out, and 20 not out. So, um, yeah, the he's next. Back. Yeah, he, he is back. And actually, he played, he made a brilliant 100 just before that as well mm. in, uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, so, yeah, after having, obviously, people didn't talk about it quite as much as like Coley's lean streak, but having had a pretty lean time of it. For quite a long time um since the end of the 2019 ashes pretty much thinking he had one test hundred in that time hmm. uh, he does yeah that's, he's going back into form just in time for next year's ashes that's hmm. good um katia Ayan asks is brathwaite the most informed test opener in the world uh he's obviously been around for for ages but he's had a really good year for west indies who themselves have shown signs of improvement recently I mean, most informed test pass, test opener in the world. Did you not see Zach Crawley's 100 at Ralph Hindu? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess so. He averages 73.88 this year in 12 innings, which is quite a lot. Um, 
And he get he does kind of fly under under the radar a little bit because he has had some pretty lean years, mm. um, especially early in his career. And I think you made the point, Yaz, that he played Test cricket way too early. Um, I think he was twenty when he made his debut, twenty one, something like that. Um, but when you don't have the depth of talent like the West Indies do, then you're going to end up playing cricket, um, Test cricket, too early. Um, there's that stat that he's the only opener to score a, a test hundred for the West Indies since 2013, I think it is. Um, so he's clearly very, very good and in quite a bit of form at the minute. Um, he's one of those rare ones where the captaincy hasn't really affected his batting. His average is pretty identical, um, whether he's captain or not. And when you look at his stats in isolation, they don't look that impressive. He's got an overall test average of less than 40. But when you take into context his career with the side he's been batting in, averaging nearly 40 when the rest of your side average about 30 is always more impressive than averaging mm. 50 in a team that's full of geniuses. Mm. So, yeah, if he's been, he, yeah, he's he's really good, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and he's got the nice little stat of batting, having batted with his current opening partner's dad as well, yeah, which is always yeah. quite nice. That was nice. I think there was something that Mitchell Stark has now dismissed both Chanderpoles in cricket <laughs> as well. It's quite cool. Um, ben, the other big news from Australia this week, um, if you ignore Justin Langer and everything that's going on there, is uh, around the David Warner captaincy ban. So he put out a statement today saying that he's no longer going to contest that ban, uh, saying that family is more important than all the stuff that's, that might come out around it. Um, it's, it's not that straightforward, Ben, because it's not, it's not as if he's, he's, he's at war with Cricket Australia here. No, it's it's a it's a strange situation where what he's angry at in particular is the review process, which is kind of independent, which I suppose in some ways should be a good thing, right? You want things to be independent of uh, a governing body who, you know, you might have people in there who have their own interests and political affiliations and that sort of thing in terms of uh, who they want to see uh award things or not and you don't want it to be like a pr decision or to be swayed by that sort of thing so the independence is good from some point of view but warner was uh was very scathing in his statement and seems to be supported by cricket australia in it so he says that he wants to, uh, that the council assisting in the review panel um wanted uh to conduct public spe spectacle to in the panel's words have a cleansing and then said i'm not prepared for my family to be the washing machine for cricket's dirty laundry and also said that they sort of wanted to do a, a public lynching on him uh so it's 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 a really strange situation and and yeah i guess because it had seemed like all the momentum was for david warner to uh retake or to, for that ban to be lifted and for probably for him to lead australia again in some capacity whether just mm. in t20 cricket or maybe even in uh in, in odi cricket possibly in that world cup i mean i know cummins has, has been put in place as that captain but it wouldn't be impossible to see that happening and that now seems like it like it won't happen mm. um so yeah it's a strange situation uh and but that might well be the last of it possibly i mean if Warren is just like not worth the hassle and he is he is 36 quite old, yeah exactly, so yeah it's five years pretty much five years since cape town you could um, have timed it better though with steve smith captaining them yes that's true match. that is true um yeah steve smith will be captaining australia for the second test match because uh, Pat Cummins is out with an injury and uh, our good friend Scott Boland is back on the side for the first time since the Ashes. Um, reminded that he averages nine in test cricket with the ball. Um, as of today, Bangladesh are 2-0 up in an ODI series against India. Both games have been really, really good to so today. Bangladesh recovered from 69 for seven to post 271. Mehdi Hassan Miraz scored 100 from number eight. Uh, he was also the hero in the first game as well, hitting 38 or 39 as they won by one wicket. You had this weird situation in this game where Rohit Sharma injured his hand, I think. So went off the field and he only came in down the order and he, he had to score 40 off the last two overs uh, to get the win. And they needed six off the last ball. So he very, very nearly did it. Um, but Ben, that is a massive win for Bangladesh. There have been loads of false storms with them in limited overs cricket before the World Cup last year, T20 World Cup last year. They had loads of really good bilateral results, but in hindsight, they were all on very spin-friendly conditions that really suited them that were quite different to what we've seen in the last two World Cups. But in ODI cricket, they've, they've got a, a better record than they've had in T20 cricket recently. And this India side isn't at 100% full strength, but it's also still pretty strong. Yeah, th this is the first 
real statement, I think. And it'll be as much how Bangladesh held their nerve, I suppose, as much as uh, the caliber of the option they'd be. I suppose if, if they had just if they had just smashed them, maybe you'd say that is proof that they're stronger. And, you know, relying on on runs from Mahedi, who averages about 20 no die cricket, you might say that's not the most sustainable uh, game plan. The, ga- the games are both so good, by the way. That first, I mean, the first game was, you had a couple of screamers, you had like uh, l- like brilliant spells from Shakib Abadot, Siraj, Rahul at number five played a blinder, two lower order collapses that hit wicket. Uh, there was a dot ball free hit with two runs needed. It was so good. Uh, um, but yeah, so how, how good are Bangladesh? I guess... You, it's, it is possible to quibble like I sort of just did with this series. Uh, and, you know, they've got 12 runs mating in the Super League. But then you look at what those wins have been and they've beaten Afghanistan, Sri Lanka and West Indies at home. And they've beaten Zimbabwe away and they've beat, uh, again, a week in South Africa side away from home. So you can just sort of say, well, they haven't proven themselves against the very best teams. This India side is a step towards, this India win is a step towards doing that. And also, actually, if they are able to beat those sorts of teams in these sorts of conditions... That does make them semi-final contenders at the World Cup, mm. I think. I mean, New Zealand won five games to make the semis in 2019. Bangladesh, I think, have that within reach just about. They need to play really, really well. But, you know, they have that sort of momentum with them. And then if you look at their players, I mean, Shakib is bowling as well as ever. He was absolutely brilliant in that first ODI. There was a, an arm ball to Rohit Sharma uh, that he didn't didn't read at all and sort of went through the gate to, to bowl him and then turn another one past the uh, the outside edge of, I think, Washington Sundar. No, through through that of Shard of the core to, to hit off stump. He was he was brilliant. Um, and then you've got Lytton Das, who has for a while sort of had a lot of potential, but now looks like he is peaking. He made a good 41 in that first game and he's, what, 28. So he should be peaking for that next World Cup. He's captain for this series. Uh, I like the look of Afif Hussain as an all-rounder down the order. Um, Eberdot Hussain is still consi- continuing that really odd career. So people might remember that he, so he averages about 56 with the ball in Test cricket still, despite taking... An incredible six for to beat New Zealand in New Zealand. Uh, was it at the start of this year or the end of last yeah, year? About that. Uh, and then has come in. This is, this is only his third ODI, but he took four for in the first game, another two or three in this game. Um, he got Coley in this game. So uh, yeah, he kind of looks like a proper ODI quick. He's also batting at like number <laughs> number nine or number ten, which is a, a couple of places too high at least. And they've still, you know, the fizz is still still the fizz. So there are a lot of good players there. And they are putting results together. Um, But yeah, you do look at previous sort of times when it's all seemed like they're getting together, like the 2015 World Cup. They Mm. beat England to get to the quarterfinals, actually do pretty well against India in that quarterfinal and then beat India at home as well shortly after that series, but didn't quite kick on again. Although I guess they made the, did they get to the semifinals of the Champions Trophy? They did, didn't they? And then again, fell away. So so maybe it's harsh to say that they're, they, they have just been slowly getting better. Those results have been improving. And actually, if you look at their performances in global tournaments and then the Super League, they do deserve to just maybe not even be, well, dark horses to win it, but not even dark horse for the semifinals, just mm. contenders for it, I think. And yeah, I think it's worth reminding people just how close that 2019 World Cup was. Like loads of teams have between three and five wins and inconceivably any of them could have got that full spot that New Zealand ended up getting. Mm-hmm. Um, in the county game, Paul Farbrace is the new head coach at Sussex. Uh, it's been a tumultuous time at Sussex on and off the pitch in recent times. Uh, their former head coach, Ian Salisbury, it's his third mention of the show, uh, left under a cloud uh, due to off-field reasons. Uh, there's a really good piece by Will McPherson in the Telegraph from a few weeks ago that kind of detailed what's gone on at the county. Um, I guess it's just quite a big, quite a big signing, Paul Farbrace. Far, you know, Farbrace has um, got experience in international cricket, Quite a big personality, and you'd think that he, he's not just there to um, for Sussex to make up the numbers. Um, anyway, just one final thing on the show. There's no T10 update today. Um, just my moment of the week. We've not really done moments of the week recently, but I saw this video and thought I had to had to share it with the world. Um, so Fabian Allen uh, is the star of this one. There's this TikTok that has gone very viral on TikTok um, from a woman who claims was in a brief relationship with the West Indies all-rounder. And she tells this brilliant story where Alan made a very big deal about giving her a really nice gift. And she got her hopes up, thought it'd be something really shiny, maybe jewellery. And it ends up just being a signed Polaroid of Alan Fielding, which I thought was very funny, even if it's not quite true. Um, but it's, the story is told very well. That that That's where, um, yeah, 
That's why it's so good. He's a very good fielder. <laughs> there are worse <laughs> fielders you can get a signed picture of, I'll tell you that. That's true. Do you know what, though? If that doesn't sum up the T10, I don't know what does. <laughs> yeah. I have a T10 update, actually. Thank you. Uh, Andre Fletcher, West Indies batter, uh, was dropped four times in one innings. Um, and that's in a T10 innings. So that's a, that's a very high <laughs> drop catch to, 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 to shot ratio. Um, um, and that, yeah, perhaps sums it up. The T ten's over. Is you it? Oh no, who won? T ten's over. So the Deccan Gladiators beat the New York Strikers by thirty seven runs oh. in the final. Doesn't Moe you know you play for the Deccan Gladiators? If you know that, you're <laughs> fired, I think. <laughs> <laughs> if he does, he wasn't picked for the final. Um Maybe so do, do you hear what happened in the final? Yeah. Uh so Deck Gladiators, um, were sent in by the strikers. Mm. You, think, you think they're regretting that now? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they opened with Suresh Rayner and Tom Kyler Cadmore. Great. Uh, both removed by Akil Hussain. Andre Rossett at three, bowled by Wahab Riaz for nine. I feel like you could come up with like some kind, kind, kind <laughs> yeah, of computer code to come up with like a match report. For yeah, generated T10 yeah, score exactly. Card, yeah. Yeah. Um, Nicholas Puran, that's the one thing we know is that he's hitting them well and he did hit them well again, 40 of 23. Uh, and then David Wieser, in number five, 43 off 18, four sixes uh, in that short innings. Uh, Rashid Khan was playing for the for the uh, strikers. Two overs that only went for 10. Riaz, despite taking that wicket of Russell, uh, one for 43 off his two. Um, and then in the, the chase, the strikers uh, were, were blown away, really. Um, Paul Sterling out for six. Uh, Mohamed Hussain got him. Mohamed Hussain took two for 14. Josh Little took two for four, mm. opening the bowling with Hussain, which left them uh, with left the strikers with far, far too much to, to, to do to get back into that game. So congratulations to the, De- the Deccan uh, Gladiators. So per- Percy um, Fenner didn't get a game in that one, did he? <laughs> Percy Fenner did not get a game in that one. Anyway, that is all we have time for today. Um, a sub 50 minute show, which is excellent news. Um, for me Uh, thanks Ben thanks Katia we'll be back straight after the second Pakistan England test match next week